president of Abrevia. He is going to talk to us about AI for intelligent contract analytics. Welcome, Great. Nick. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen and we can go through some slides. Just give me one second. Okay. Great, so hopefully everybody uh, can see my screen now. And thanks so much, Matt, for that uh, discussion of AI and the future of AI. I think it uh, really provides some nice context and, and I learned quite a bit um, as you were going through it. So, so thank you. Um, so I'm again, I'm Ned Gannon. I'm co-founder and president of Ebrevia. Um, I will also be talking about AI, uh, but a little bit more in the context of a, a practical application related to uh, analyzing contracts. Yeah, just advance the slides here. There we go. Um, so to tell you a little bit about myself and my background, I'm a corporate attorney by training. I spent a lot of time, particularly as a junior associate, uh, reviewing contracts as part of the due diligence process and mergers and acquisitions. So, organizations who have huge. Oh, I heard a little uh, heard a little background there. Um, but essentially, uh, the due diligence process in M&A consists of large teams of junior attorneys going through all the target company's contracts, looking for problematic provisions, and summarizing their content. Now, I know we, we probably have some entrepreneurs in the audience, um, so I'd imagine the due diligence process is something you're going to be more familiar with than you want to be uh, when you do eventually come to your, your exit opportunity. So while I was practicing law, I just saw how inefficient and inaccurate this process could be, how costly it was for our clients. And I thought there had to be a better way to, to go through this contract review. So I co-founded Ebrevia and partnered with Columbia University's Data Science Institute, essentially to leverage some of their machine learning technology and expertise to apply it to this legal application. So Ebrevia's clients include law firms, audit consulting firms, uh, corporate legal departments, financial institutions, and alternative legal service providers. And after growing the company over time, uh, we were acquired by DFIN in December of 2018. DFIN's a public company um, that focuses on risk and compliance solutions. So today what I'll do, I, and I think Matt provided a you know, great overview of artificial intelligence. Um, I'll talk a little bit about it as well, specifically related to uh, contract analytics to provide some context. I'll though, then go into uh, contract review generally, uh, contract analytics specifically. Um, I'll talk about some implementation best practices that we've seen to encourage adoption. I think that could really be helpful for other types of uh, enterprise applications as well. And then just wrap up with some startup lessons learned, uh, you know, on really on my journey of, of taking something from an idea through, uh, through a successful exit. So why is uh, now a great time for contract analytics? Well, there's really a confluence of trends in the legal industry that is, is promoting this type of technology. So in corporate legal departments, you're seeing an increase in compliance requirements, as well as just an explosion of data, 90% of data created within the last two years. Um, and also a real need to track obligations and risks uh, contained in contracts. With respect to audit compliance, uh, there's a whole host of regulatory uh, frameworks that are coming out that require large scale contract review projects. So this is the LIBOR transition for financial institutions, uh, GDPR, IFRS 15, IFRS 16, and a wide range of other uh, recent regulations. In law firms, uh, clients are sometimes refusing to pay for junior level work. Uh, law firms are also seeing competition from the big four and alternative legal service providers. Um, particularly in EMEA, we're seeing more uh, flat fee arrangements. So a lot of pressures on law firms to create more value and, and be more efficient. And then finally, even in areas like commercial real estate, uh, there's pressure to increase uh, efficiency with lease abstraction. So AI comes into the legal industry in a wide variety of different ways. Um, e-discovery is, is, is an early adoption uh, of AI. So e-discovery is essentially the process of reviewing large quantities of emails or documents in a response to discovery requests in a, in a litigation context. You also have litigation analysis and outcome prediction. Um, so that's looking to see which courts might uh, fa decide favorably uh, for your client. There's, of course, legal research, intellectual property law, 
uh, contract review and due diligence, which again is where eBrevia plays, and then legal spend analytics. Um, so this is corporate legal departments going through the invoices from law firms to make sure they're, they're complying with outside counsel spending guidelines. So I think Matt, as, as I said, did a great job on providing an overview of, of artificial intelligence. I'll just delve in a little bit more specifically related to contract analytics. Um, but essentially, artific an artificial intelligence is a machine that can perform tasks thought to require human level intelligence. Its applications are as varied as the applications of human cognition. So I like to think about this in terms of strong AI and weak AI. Strong AI is a machine with a mind that's roughly as capable as a human at any task requiring general intelligence. And then weak AI or applied AI is really the use of a purpose-built machine to perform specific cognitive tasks uh, that have traditionally required a human. So this is more where, where Ebrevia is. Now, weak AI doesn't mean incapable. Uh, weak AIs can drive cars and land airplanes in bad weather. They can recognize faces, they can read documents, uh, detect insider trading, and translate between languages. So this is just kind of a high level overview uh, diagram of artificial intelligence. Now in the legal industry, it's usually machine learning and natural language processing that are the most, uh, most applicable branches here. So if you think about, and this ties into uh, contract analytics, if you think about perhaps um, from a machine learning context, trying to teach a child or software to identify pictures of a cat, you might show that child a picture of a cat lying down, picture of a cat in a tree, maybe the cat is, is drinking water from its bowl. You could show the child a picture of a dog and say, this is not a cat, or show the child a picture of a tiger and, and decide whether that qualifies as a cat or not. And over time, the child or the software will, be, will begin to understand what what is a cat and be able to identify cats in images it hasn't seen before. Now, if you bring that into what we do in, in terms of the contract analytics context, you could think about that in terms of a provision like change of control. So if you show uh, the software examples of this change of control provision, it'll be able to identify, obviously, you know, that exact same provision if the wording is exactly the same in documents it hasn't seen. But the problem is a lot of these legal provisions can be descri uh, described in a wide variety of different ways. So change of control, for example, could be in an agreement using language like assignment by operation of law, or maybe sale of all or substantially all the company's assets. And you wouldn't want the, the machine uh, to miss provisions just because the vocabulary used was a little bit different, or maybe it was buried in a, a place in the contract that was a little bit different than where you'd usually find it. So we can think a little bit about how humans work. So a human might discover some simple rules for identifying a change of control provision. So change might appear within three words of control, and that could mean a provision is likely change of control. Similarly, the phrase assignment by operation of law could be a synonym for change of control. So this is essentially how machine learning works. It's testing out millions of different rules, uh, retaining those with predictive power, and then applying those rules and using them to identify these provisions on documents it hasn't seen before. Now it won't achieve 100% accuracy, but it can perform at 90% or 95% or more um, accuracy, again, on, on documents that it, it hasn't seen. So what type of, of work is conducive to artificial intelligence and machine learning technology? Well, it typically happens to be work that's uh, repetitive and routine. So if you think about some of the work that law firms do or other types of uh, service providers or even in-house legal departments, you can have junior attorneys doing tasks like reviewing contracts, extracting the data and summarizing it, and then more senior attorneys that are doing the analysis and advising. And it's really that, that junior attorney work that's most applicable to AI. So to provide a little bit of context, we can talk about the traditional approach to contract review. And this is not so much the, the one-off contracts that might be coming into a company or a law firm on a daily basis to be negotiated, but really the large scale contract review projects. So this might, again, might be due diligence and mergers and acquisitions or reviewing um, customer contracts for revenue recognition compliance. So really those, you know, 
contract review projects of hundreds or thousands of contracts. So the typical steps are to read through the contracts and search for key data. They then, uh, folks will summarize the contracts by copying and pasting data into Excel or Word or maybe a contract management system. And these abstracts or summaries go through multi-step quality control review, um, and the reviews are, are very subjective. And the process can take weeks or months. It has to be repeated if there's amendments or renewals. And at the end of the day, it's, it's very expensive. Now with contract analytics, you're using machine learning and natural language processing technology to identify legal concepts and other data within contracts, really regardless of the specific words used or where they're located in the document. So you might have a, a change of control provision in a, a separate change of control or assignment provision uh, section, or it might be buried in the termination section or even somewhere else. So again, you wanna be able to identify these concepts regardless of how they're expressed or where they might be found in the documents. Now with contract analytic systems, often they come with pre-trained provisions, which can be extracted right out of the box. And then some of the systems, including Ubrevia, actually allow non-technical users to train the software themselves to extract custom information and meet their specific needs. So what are the benefits of using a contract analytic system? Well, certainly time savings is one, and this can vary based on the experience level of the reviewer and the complexity of the project. Um, at Ebrevi, we typically see improvements of anywhere from 30 to 90%. I'd say about most clients see about a 50% time savings. Now, if you're a corporate legal department and you're paying outside counsel or another service provider, those time savings uh, typically translate directly into cost savings since many service providers bill by the hour. So a great way if you think about, again, the amount of money that's being spent on an hourly basis uh, in the legal industry, create significant amount of, of, of cost savings as well. And then finally, there's accuracy improvements. And I think the exciting thing here is it's not so much the human against the machine, but really that attorney using the software against an attorney without the software. And if you think about a lot of, you know, who are these attorneys that are doing the work, this type of work, it's often first or second year associates, they're up at two in the morning, they're going through complex documents, so it's easy for things to fall through the cracks, um, and the AI can help to help to prevent that. So I'll share a little bit on the effects of uh, the business models uh, in the legal industry, just checking my time here, okay. Um, so I'd say that it impacts business models in a variety of ways. Um, one is alternative fee arrangements. So the billable hour is the traditional model uh, when it comes to law firms and, and many other service providers. But with AI, uh, that, can, that can shift a bit. So it provides the opportunity for more uh, flat fee arrangements on some of this routine work. It's also the ability to kind of rethink the pyramid structure in law firms. Um, if you think about most traditional law firms today, there's a huge base of junior associates at the bottom of the pyramid. Using machine learning technology in the legal industry, you can actually shrink that number of associates potentially and or allocate them to, uh, to performing higher level work. Um, so definitely some, some implications there. There's uh, segmenting legal work. Um, so we, you know, when it comes to the legal industry, you often have work that's done by in-house legal departments, um, sometimes alternative legal service providers, law firms, and then a lot of work that can potentially just be pushed through the technology itself. So some abilities to do some segmentation. Also the rise of alternative legal service providers um, as opposed to the traditional law firms. And I would say many of these trends um, had started really kind of coming out of the 2008 recession where there was a big emphasis on value and efficiency. And now um, artificial intelligence is helping to enable and, and accelerate many of these. And then finally, enhanced coordination between corporates and outside service providers. So I know one of the things a lot of our clients really enjoy about eBrevia is it's an opportunity for law firms and corporations to be within the platform at the same time to really benefit from the, each other's insights and work collaboratively on a lot of these very large projects. So some of the uh, use cases for contract analytics, um, we have contract management and digitization. I'll uh, discuss that a little bit more um, in, in just a minute or so. There's certainly M&A and other transactional diligence. We have audit and compliance work. 
as well as vendor and customer management. There's real estate and extraction of data from leases, IP procurement and management, human resources, and then this customizable application. And, and this is what I alluded to before. And, and one of the things I get very excited about is it's where non-technical users can really scale their own domain expertise um, to train the software to extract custom information and meet their specific needs. And it's always fun for me to see a client come into the system, come up with a use case, and then as attorneys train the system to start identifying this very specific information. So just to delve a little bit deeper into a couple of the use cases, um, M&A due diligence, I had mentioned this earlier. Again, it's usually large teams of junior associates doing this contract review, and AI can really help out on those steps of extracting information and helping to summarize that data. Now, junior search associates typically bill out at four to $600 an hour, sometimes much more, uh, depending on the geography. Um, and they're going through and extracting this data, summarizing obligations, liabilities, and red flags. So again, using the software here can help to accelerate that process um, and improve accuracy. Now, contract management and digitization is also a, a key use case, and this is more in the corporate legal department setting. So here you have companies that have hundreds or thousands of contracts. Um, often they don't know what's in them. Sometimes they're paying for things they no longer use or missing out on revenue opportunities. Uh, they don't know that an auto renewal is coming up and they end up renewing for something that they actually don't need. Um, so with contract analytics technology, you can surface a lot of this information, make it easily accessible. It often gives these, it also gives these companies insights into their relationships with their customers, their vendors and their partners. Um, reduces risk of non-compliance, uh, both with the contracts themselves and any, any outside uh, regulations uh, as well. I will say, and, and this is interesting, so at Ibrevia, um, we've really focused on, on this to date, really focused on contract management, um, more from the perspective of very large corporations. Uh, I am excited to say we do, uh, we do have a, a new product coming out uh, called Contract Tracker, which we're launching in the next week or two. Um, which is actually targeted to small and medium-sized businesses. So for a great way for them to also gain these insights into their contracts, um, even if they just have 100 contracts or so. Uh, you know, most of the, the large corporations we deal with are, are working with thousands of contracts, but making that application and that uh, technology accessible to, to smaller types of entities as well. So now I'll just go through and share what I've seen as some implementation uh, best practices from an enterprise perspective. Now this is, is focused specifically on contract analytics um, and uh, you know, legal text uh, as well. But I think a lot of these provide some helpful lessons uh, for other enterprise types of technology. So some of the things we've seen be effective, uh, really a simple intuitive user interface is, is important, as well as the ability to show value right out of the box. Now for us, uh, it's important that the software fit naturally within, to, in, within the attorney's workflow. Um, and particularly in this pandemic, still pandemic uh, remote environment, as we're moving to post pandemic, uh, the ability to support dispersed teams. I've always found that in chatting with customers or pers uh, prospective customers, it's important to note the limitations of the software as well as its benefits. Um, I like to be very candid about that. Uh, we encourage that uh, throughout our sales team as well. And that really helps us set expectations and I think build trust um, and, and put, the, put the relationship on a, on a good trajectory right out of the gate. Integrations uh, with existing systems are, are also important. Um, so Ibrevia has a whole host of uh, pre-built integrations with virtual data rooms, contract management systems, other repositories, um, as well as an open API to help facilitate uh, that interaction between systems. We do have some clients that uh, you know, have actually just built interfaces on top of the API. So they're just pushing contracts into Ibrevia, pulling out the data and, and using it to populate their own interface, which is, which is interesting and exciting for us. I also think it's important to be able to build capacity into the product roadmap to take into account client suggestions. Some of our best ideas um, for products have, or features have come directly from clients. And also to work with clients and collaborate with them to identify additional use cases. To wrap up, I'll just share a few other uh, implementation best practices. Uh, tracking metrics is certainly important. 
Um, looking for quick wins and then communicating these broadly. This helps build, build credibility uh, throughout the organization and um, you know, encourages further adoption. You wanna leverage the credibility of internal advocates. So we found some of our most successful implementations, uh, we do have a champion uh, within the organization and they're willing to kind of go to bat for us and, and highlight the value of the, of the technology to their peers. Training is also critical. Um, so at Ibrevi, we provide 365, 24 seven support. But I think importantly too, is we do have project manager, corporate attorneys working with the clients. So these are folks that have practiced law, they've walked in our client's shoes, they know their processes and pain points. And I think that's really applicable to a wide variety of different enterprise applications. Um, I talked a little bit about the support. And then uh, finally, demos and kickoff events in different offices. So sometimes we've seen implementations kind of roll out sequentially. Uh, we'll start in one office or one uh, practice group and then expand from there. So the future of, of contract analytics specifically, um, I think we'll continue to see it move out horizontally as it gets into more niches, more legal domains. Um, I, we've seen that you know, quite a bit internally at Ibrevia uh, with non-technical users training the software in different areas. And then I think even, perhaps even more excitingly, see it kind of move up the value chain vertically as well. Um, so usurping more and more of the human tasks and adding adding uh, more value throughout the process. So getting beyond the basic extraction of the data and actually providing higher levels of analysis on top of it. So finally, I'll just wrap up with a few uh, lessons learned along the way. I know I'm almost at my time here, so I'll move through these pretty quickly. Um, but time is an entrepreneur's most valuable resource. Um, CEOs need to be relentless about protecting team members' time. Um, in the startup environment, you need to move quickly, take calculated risks and, and iterate. This was a bit of an adjustment for me coming from practicing law, uh, but I learned quickly, you can't always have everything teed up just right. You have to kind of make decisions and keep the, keep the momentum going. Talent is critical. Um, a highly talented employee creates more value than several mediocre ones. You should look for employees that are resilient, take ownership of processes, step into gaps. Early technical talent is key, uh, particularly during that critical phase where you're building the product. You wanna trust the judgment of smart people who are closest to the information. And if an employee is coasting or unwilling to take ownership, incompetent or not collaborative, uh, you wanna wrap up. Oh, and it looks like I'm, I'm at my time. Um, I see our, our moderator coming back on here. Uh, so, so thank you very much. Um, I'll just say strategic partnerships are a great way to scale. Thought leadership's important for marketing. And I really appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to tune in. So thank you. Thank you, Ned. That was really informative. And I'm sure our attendees enjoyed that session. Mm -hmm.